right, we'll everybody take a seat and we'll get started with this. Um, I think today we've got something that we think is going to be a really interesting discussion. It's actually a debate, and we have the, the surgery contingent, the medicine contingent here to look at his problem of obesity and try to say how, do, how should we address it. And what's the, we know it's a threat. We know it's an enlarging, increasing threat, and how do we deal with it? I think most of us find out that we're not very effective. And so this is the day, the reason we're looking at this. And we've got speakers, and it includes, and I'll read off your credentials so I don't overlook something. But first is Tina Constantine, who's Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Division of Endocrinology here. Then we have Ed Lynn, who is Professor of Surgery and Head of the Division of General and GI Surgery. And Ed is also uh, Associate Program Director for Emory Endosurgery Fellowship. And is also the Director of Gastroenterology Treatment Center in the Esophageal Physiology Lab. And then it puts on top of that is Surgical Director of the Emory Bariatric Center. Got a lot of titles there. <laughs> and then and we have Peter Toule, who is a Professor of Medicine, Division of Endocrinology, I think primary base of the VA, and we're glad to have you here with us, Peter. Glad to have all of you. And so I'll turn it over to you. You're going to start, Christine. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Um, so I'm just going to start stirring up questions about the discussion that we're going to have today. I don't have any financial relationship to it, so it's everything to just say. So just general statistics number. Um, 36% of U.S. adults have a BMI above 30 by 2013. Probably half of the U.S. men and almost half of U.S. women will be obese. It's a high medical cost, around $147 billion in 2008. And there are more and more obesity drugs that are being prescribed. With intensive lifestyle treatment, we can achieve 7 to 10% weight loss at one year. And the problem, regardless of what we use, whether lifestyle, medication, even surgery, Long-term weight na maintenance is difficult, and weight regain has been a problem. So just looking at the prevalence of self-reported obesity among U.S. adults, we see not a single state has a prevalence less than 20%. Um, so the, the elements of this perfect storm of this obesity epidemic, we're calling it epidemic because it's around over 30 countries worldwide, and, just, and it, there is no solution so far. Uh, it's more complicated than what we think. It's not just calories in and calories out. We should look at the food environment, additional triggers including life stressors, quality of sleep, pollution, and the psychosocial factors as well and financial stress, and decreased physical activity and occupational activities and more relying more on transportation and being less active. All of this, depending on the genetics and age and the sex, we have variable uh, responses and uh, weight gain. So it's more complicated than what we think. We see that there's an increase in diabetes, which parallels the increase in obesity in the U.S., with a 96% increase from 1998 to 2012 in obesity, and there's a 43% increase in diabetes. We look at the prevalence of weight-related comorbidities in the U.S., and we look at different uh, subgroups, and we see in the obese group there's higher prevalence of hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetes. Uh, this is a classic uh, uh, review uh, from in The Lancet in 2009. We see that in both sexes, mortality was lowest at about BMI of 22.5 uh, to 25, uh, right here. And with each uh, five kilogram per meter square higher BMI, there's an average associated with about 30% higher overall mortality. And the most mostly was vascular disease, whether it was stroke or ischemic heart disease. So this is just a question for the audience, and you can just raise up hand just to see what you think about this. This is the first question for today. So in 2013, the American Medical Association classified obesity as a disease. Do you agree with this decision? Okay, so just to see the two perspectives, that it's not a very straightforward answer. Sometimes there are people who are saying, yes, this is, this, is a, this is a disease, and physicians now will pay more attention to the condition. It will help improve reimbursement for obesity, whether it's drug, surgery, or counseling. Uh, it would reduce the stigma of obesity that stems that the widespread perception that it's simply the result of 
eating too much or exercising too little. It's actually a disease, and it can impair body function. So the second point of view about against con saying that it's a um, disease, the limitation of the definition of obesity and the use of BMI, and also by declaring it as a disease, we're saying that one-third of Americans are ill and could lead to more reliance on costly drugs and surgery rather than lifestyle changes. It should be considered more as a risk factor and not a disease. So another question for the group. Um, is increased rates of obesity related to the social acceptance of wide range of body sizes, including extreme obesity? Do you think this is contributing? Yes? Okay, this is just uh, something to think about. And just uh, quickly, I just wanted to pinpoint that we don't need to lose a lot of weight to see benefit. Just doing 5 to 10% weight loss, we can reduce cardiovascular disease risk factors, prevent or delay the development of diabetes, and improve other health consequences. Benefits of A1C can start as little as 2% weight loss, and the effects are direct and linear when it comes to fasting blood glucose, blood pressure, and triglycerides. And these are the different interventions that are currently in use. Uh, we can expect around 5 to 15% weight loss in the combination medical therapy and with the less invasive procedures, up to 5 to 7% maybe with lifestyle and drugs. We start seeing more with lab band, which is not being used a lot currently, around 20%. We go with the sleeve, 25, 30%, bypass, 30% and more. And this will be discussed, the bariatric surgery role. So the questions to be addressed, is bariatric surgery as compared with medical obesity treatment, is it associated with improvement and prevention uh, of metabolic comorbidities but higher rates of complications? So what are the pros and cons of bariatric surgery? All right, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. I just want to, uh, I have nothing to disclose, but I will tell you that this is a rematch between me and Peter, because we were up at some World Congress on diabetes. I was a token surgeon asked to give, a, give the other side uh, the benefits of bariatric surgery. He told me it was, he didn't even share slides with me to start with, right? And he told me this is going to be, uh, it'll be very, you know, low keyed. And I presented my data, I was very scientific about it, and then he, came up and swallowed me up, okay? And he left, <laughs> there were very sc few scraps for anybody to pick, pick up, so you're gonna have to forgive me uh, here because uh, this is gonna get personal. It's, uh, it's very personal, Peter, okay? <laughs> so these are common two -like mi myths that he was gonna uh, propagate throughout his talk later. Th he tells you this is, a sa uh, it's a safer medically, to, to man it's safer to medically manage uh, the 78 or more obese ob Americans in the United States. But yet, as Tina showed us, that only 2.8 million people are being treated with medications. So, you know, go, go Peter. Way, way to go. The VA is doing a great job here. Surgery, it's going to tell you the surgery is cruel and it's akin to doing lobotomies to people and castrations. And it's a little shocking that he would say these things. And this is what they, he tells his patients. Mrs. Smith, your BMI is 60. We just upped your Genuvia. And I notice your right leg is bluer than the left. Just remember to exercise every day. So, you know, his press gainy scores go up, and he gets these mysterious 3 a.m. Twitter saying, Tilly do is doing a great job. Don't believe anything anybody's telling you. Telling you it's all fake news. And then he'll tell you things like, if surgery doesn't kill you, you will kill yourself. It's a little sad. And the uh, reality is major depressive dis disorders are underappreciated, uh, underdiagnosed, and you know, you, we typically discover it at the time of crisis. And surgery, if you don't take care of people right, it is a stress, uh, you, you, it is a stressor. But, you know, uh, or Peter, he's probably gonna say things like, you know, uh, if you don't, if d don't hurt yourself, you're probably okay, you're not crazy. So I just want you to put this in perspective for you. This is what he's gonna come up with. And this is what I'm gonna tell you about obesity surgery, okay? It starts off with a social problem. And this is probably where we agree people don't recognize that they have a problem. And this is a, a blog from the Washington Post, 
This is 1990 and 2014. This is the amount of people who are truly overweight, 70.4 when they surveyed them, and but uh, sorry, 36 percent of them thought they are really only over uh, are overweight. But 70 percent of these guys are actually overweight. They don't realize what, what's happening to them. Um, this is another way to look at it: men, women, their ideal weight where they should be, and this is their actual weight. Same thing for the women. They th the ideal weight is about 140 for these patients, actual weight. And this has gone on from 1990 up to, to 2016. People's perception or body self-image has changed uh, to what's acceptable. Um, this is not just in the United States. This is a, uh, a British uh, study for adolescents. Even the kids, they took uh, 2,600 boys, 2,300 girls, aged 13 to 15, surveyed them. They uh, overestimation is uncommon. What they found was 60% overweight, where only 60% of the patients correctly uh, estimated their weight, whereas 39% underestimated their own weight. So our pe the big question we have to ask is, are people seeing their weight differently? Okay, Are you looking at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm okay? And this is, tends to be what, what the, the big problem with the social acceptance of uh, obesity uh, is. Well, let me just tell you quickly about the types of bariatric surgery. We break it up into three different types. A restrictive type, which limits the volume of intake. I see some people eating lunch now, and if you have a restrictive operation, maybe half of what you can take or a third of what you take uh, will go down without you hurting yourself. Then there's, there's a malabsorptive operation where a significant reduction in gut nutrient absorption is, uh, happens. But what we see more commonly is a combination of these two where you have both. These are the uh, primary operations. The gold standard from the 1950s was a gastric bypass, and it's, you know, the University of Iowa, you get these big farmers, and overall, if they show up, they have perforated gastric ulcers. And they did these operations that remove a portion of the stomach, and rerouted the stomach, and they found that these patients went from BMIs of 60 down to 20s and 30s. So they, they, they actually, and this, this guy uh, at Mason actually decided, you know, what if we just don't cut out the stomach, push the stomach off to the side, we can use it for other purposes later, and we will create a small pouch up here, reroute the intestines so you don't absorb as much, and that's how this whole gastric bypass operation came about. So this is a gastric, operation, gastric bypass operation with restriction and malabsorptive component. A thing that came out in the early 2000s, that's probably a very popular operation now, it's probably about 50, 52 percent of the operations that are being done throughout the world, is a sleeve gastrectomy. We take the stomach that's the size of my head, we remove about 80 percent, 75 to 80 percent of the stomach, leaving you a tube that looks like the sleeve of your jacket. And this is very much a sleeve gastrectomy, a, a restrictive operation. You can talk about the hormonal aspects of ghrelin and all that, but at the end of the day, it is a volume uh, control procedure. Another volume control uh, uh, procedure that's still out there, still being done, is the band operation that people put down, uh, put a, a silastic ring at the upper part of your stomach, the cardia, and with a port that's connected to the subcutaneous tissue, you can inject it, to fill it, and uh, and s remove some fluid. And it's, it was really hot. In the 2000s, I couldn't talk a patient out of it. You would wake up in the morning, you see that big lion, uh, lion commercial, and, they were t and people's lives would change, and happy and smiling people. I couldn't talk people out of it. Because they sold it as, you'll lose a lot of weight, and we can remove it. Uh, the reality is it's not that easy to remove these things. And after a few years, people lose their efficacy very fast. And as we were putting them in, I started getting data from the Europeans, colleagues from Europe saying, hey, this is not working. That we were having 50% complications, 50% of these bands were being taken out. But there are centers who are still doing these, and it, it's good. I think I'm taking out more of these than I am putting in. Uh, and this is, this is band operation. True story, you know, we had patients from, uh, from Germany, and they found out how the port felt. And Oktoberfest comes around, they will stuck out some of the fluid, go ha enjoy the Oktoberfest and put the fluid back in. It's very self-defeating, okay. Alternative bariatric procedures, you've heard about the vagal stimulator. It's a tricky operation to do. It's a um, power device that's the size of a lot of your uh, iPhones. And you plant it in a subcutaneous tissue and every day you charge it with a wand. I don't know what the long-term effects of that charging through your skin is. So you plant that there. And then surgically, you have to place these little couple, 
uh, uh, couplings around the vagus nerve. So there's a little digging involved. Uh, so it's $19,000 to do, okay? Um, I'm not a big fan of this, and that's not typically our patient population. And there is an intestinal aligner that you can place in patients, and uh, you pa place this plastic tube down the esophagus, uh, down the esophagus and into the pylorus and let this tube go down there. What the whole idea is to induce a malabsorptive uh, situation for the patients. They, they are effective to a certain, uh, uh, certain degree, but they have to stop, the esoph uh, stop this uh, during the trials in the United States because patients develop cholangitis. And what happened was that I think you blocked the bile, bile drainage uh, uh, w with these liners, so they had to stop that trial. Uh, but while it was there, it, it did work for a lot of people with diabetes. There's an intragastric balloon. This is probably the hottest thing. Again, now if you're old enough, if you have enough gray hair, you'll remember some of the uh, uh, gastric balloons that used to be implanted in people's stomachs, and they look like soda cans. And the problem with that is it was very malleable, and patients would get bowel obstruction. So in the middle of the night, the surgeons would wake up and have plucked these things out of the, the, the intestines with an operation. Well, they've changed it. Now it's circular, it's round, it's a different type of plastic that doesn't shrivel with temperature, and it sits there. It's supposed to induce uh, um, uh, uh, early satiety. But the number one complaint for these patients, 90% of them, is that they get nausea. And in our culture, in the Western culture, nausea is a bad thing. Nobody, we don't tolerate that very well. So the readmissions to the hospital uh, is quite high when you place these things in. So you got to be prepared. Uh, people pay um, about eight thousand dollars for this. In around town, you c we've seen prices from thirty nine hundred all the way there up to ten thousand. At least at the Emory site, the way we charge people, I cannot get it under ten thousand dollars. So patient pa patients pay cash for this. They expect you to give them the, your, your cell phone numbers because they're going to be calling you m 24 hours a day, okay? So this is an intragastric balloon, th and so these are all the uh, alternatives that are out there. I, this is the one that's right now, there are several companies uh, out there. The price range is probably the biggest impediment for people who uh, have to pay for this. Insurance will not cover this. Okay, but surgery for me uh, is not about weight control alone. There are benefits to this. Uh, headaches, pseudos, uh, tumor cerebri, dyslipidemia, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, gastroesophageal reflux disease. We've seen people three, four weeks after their surgery and they come off their insulin. And you, you wonder, is this just a matter of starvation? Possibly. But is there a lot more hormonal aspect that goes into this? So there are a lot of things that actually b are, are beneficial. So we should start getting away from talking about BMIs and weight to talk about the metabolic effects of surgery. You can't talk about metabolic surgery or bariatric surgery without the Stampede trial, okay? In 2012, this came in. They t they, um, Bill Shower at the Cleveland Clinic did this. What happened was the background goes like this. We were at the Endocrine Society meeting, and well, there was this big symposium, and they invited surgeons. So we were outnumbered again, 80 to 20, okay? The surgeons were outnumbered. And then we provided all this data about why diabetes, how diabetes go away, and they said, we won't believe this until you do a randomized trial. And the NIH was there, but they wouldn't fund it. So we got industry to fund this, uh, fund this study. So it was actually a randomized trial. They did a first year, third year outcome study. And what they did was take, took 150 patients with uncontrolled diabetes. 50 went underwent intensive medical therapy. 50 went un, uh, gas, had gastric bypass. 50 had the sleeve gastrectomy, which is the restrictive operation. 12 months, 36 months, and then five years later. The goal was very simple, the primary goal. We're just gonna get A1C six to six or under. Very clean, very clean study. And this is what they found. At, I'll just present 36 uh, months, 91% follow up. Not bad, not bad for a study like this. Medical therapy, this is the change. Uh, percentage change from, uh, the, uh, the, the from baseline, it went down. Medical therapy, by three years, it did go back up. Sleeve gastrectomy, gastric bypass stay down quite uh, much, lo uh, much longer. Um, this is for the A1C levels. We can skip this slide. Diabetes medications. These are the number of medications. The medical therapy really never came off their diabetes medications, whereas the surgical group dropped down from three medications down to one to one, one, one to one and a half. And the gastric bypass patients, that was probably the most effective. The body mass index, as we know, medical therapy, it did drop some, but it, 
at the end of the day, wasn't very significant. But the gastric bypass and the surgical patients, the sleeve gastrectomies, they stay down. Five years. This is the one that came out last February. Um, A1C. That's what they were talking about. This is the uh, A1C levels. Every s people were about 9, 10 when they started for medical group. It went back up to, it, w it dropped initially to 7, came back to about 9. M surgical group, they went down to 7. Uh, uh, and also, it, it climbed, crept up after 3 to 5 years. What you do notice, and I'll tell you that it wasn't, it's surgery is not perfect, is nobody really stayed 6 or lower. Okay? However, the, uh, the medication, the number of medications that were being used in the medical group, if you see the dark color, that just means that these people are off of medications. Very few were off medications in the medical group. The gastric bypass group, at, in fi at five years, 45% uh, percent of them were off their uh, diabetes medications. Sleep gastrectomy, 25%. Now, what ha I've used this uh, information to tell somebody who comes to the office and says, hey, I want the sleep gastrectomy, and I see that they are on two anti-hyperglycemic uh, medications. I'll coach them. I'll say, you know what? The data shows that if you have a gastric bypass, you're going to probably do better with your diabetes. You're going to get more bang for the buck. And uh, I'll, p I'll give them this information and I'll help them decide. But I don't want them to come and say, I want to sleep because I want my diabetes to go away if that was their primary goal, but, but it's the less involved operation. You know, I don't want fear to government govern what they want to do and what uh, what their end goal, end game is. So that's a uh, five-year SAMP trial, and I think that, for me, summarizes medicine versus surgical, uh, uh, versus sur uh, medical versus surgical therapy. One person did die in this trial, okay? Not from medical complications, but they, they died for a, a cause I don't re, uh, quite remember. I, and this is the body mass index. The medical group, this is the amount change from the baseline, not very significant. You get most of the bang for the buck with the surgical therapy. So what can we learn from the Stampede trial? One, surgical therapy is far superior than medical therapy with diabetes control. Gastric bypass has slight advantage over sleep gastrectomy, and I tell people it will be good for two conditions. If your body mass index is greater than 50, the super obese people, or if you have diabetes that you're trying to overcome. Um, durability of surgery at 60 months, it's demonstrated. However, oh, A1C never really reached six or below six in these patients, even though many of them are off their medications. And beware, there is a slight loss of surgical eff effectiveness after year two and beyond. So we uh, typically see the patients within the first year and then the follow-up drops off. And I think those people who are, and, and Peter may say this, I, I don't remember what he's gonna say, but people may say this, that, that, oh, look at these patients, they're not doing any better today. They're eight years out, they're not doing any better. These people were lost to follow-up. These people were abandoned. And in our group, we try to make sure these patients come. In fact, the ASMBS, which is the, uh, or the American College of Surgeons, which is the accrediting body, for weight loss surgery centers, the comprehensive bariatric med uh, uh, centers insist that we follow these patients. And they track us to see how often they come back. And we kind of get slapped on the wrist when we don't uh, follow the patients well. There's going to be a time that when we don't follow our patients well, they're going to say, you're not going to be a center of excellence, or you're gonna, we're going to curtail the insurance companies that's going to be able to be sent to your uh, patients that will be sent your way. OK. We, we, this is why I wake up in the morning to do uh, bariatric surgery. This is our, our data. We just took 15 patients, people with normal fasting glucose, type 2 diabetes, impaired fasting glucose, not, f or not clearly at diabetes yet. This is the confidence interval to, of the healthy subjects. This is the insulin secretion. This, <coughs> this is uh, insulin resistance. For a patient who's type, uh, who's actually, I'll start from here. Patients who with normal fasting glucose, they're all right. They, they don't uh, have uh, much insulin re uh, they, they don't need much insulin secretion, but after six months after surgery, 12 mo 24 months after surgery, we are able to move them into this normal range. For patients with type 2 diabetes, they are out here. They don't secrete much insulin. They have, uh, and what happens is that after six months of from surgery, we push them into a normal range. 24 months with these patients, they were back into this, uh, uh, the, uh, they stayed in the normal range with, in terms of re uh, controlling their diabetes. And the same thing for impaired fasting glucose. I thank Nana Glexu and uh, Larry Phillips for helping us put this graph together when we first published this thing. Uh, 
we were able to do CAT scans on their patients and map out how much visceral obesity. We compared subcutaneous fat and visceral fat, and we found that it was the visceral fat that was actually metabolically active. It should probably be given organ status. And we can measure how much fat a person has in their belly. Okay, so we take these patients with normal fasting glucose. We, on average, they had about 3,300 cc's of fat, and so three liters, uh, soda liter bo uh, bottles. People with impaired, with impaired fasting glucose and diabetes, at the 5,000 mark, that's when they actually flip into this diabetes range. I, we found this very fascinating, and, and so we can use now a, a CT scan or MRI, if you want, to reduce radiation to map out how much fat is inside, estimate how much fat is inside people's belly and know what the cutoff is. So if I see a patient, and now it's not practical to do a CT scan as a screening for, for a lot of patients, but I can tell them that, hey, if we know how much obesity you have, and there are surrogates for this. You can measure waist circumference, supine. Henry Kahn did, did, did this as well, right? He can, you can do a supine sit, standing up and it, uh, uh, estimate how much fat is inside your abdominal cavity. And from that, you can say, you know, for you, I can tell you this is a better operation for you versus the other one that you want. Uh, the biggest problem with non-surgical management, I'm going to tell you right now, is surgeons are involved at the final stages. It's n too common that I get some patients that people have managed uh, 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 for a long time before they come to me. And the other problem is the, is the lack of comprehensive management. We have been working in silos way too long, and that's why you're going to see these failures. And, you know, uh, it's we're really thrilled that Tina actually holds, as an endocrinologist, sees endocrine patients upstairs and on um, one half a day a week, she comes down and manages our man, uh, uh, bariatric patients down in our clinic. And we need a lot more of this coll collaboration and comprehensive management. Uh, the economic cost of managing obesity is high. This is from your organization, right? The, the, the price has uh, is three, uh, three times, uh, up three times is $322 billion. That's the, the, the cost of society. Um, the total cost of diabetes management, 43% hospital inpatient care. 18% are, are for uh, uh, medications and their complications. 12% for medications and supplies. It's about $13,000, $14,000 a year to manage a diabetic who's not terribly complicated. That's the cost of this. Do the numbers, right? Diabetes account for one in five healthcare dollars right now. What about the cost of surgery? Let's compare this. We'll do the sleep gas retching. If you pay cash today, and I will take your money, it's $25,000. Gastric bypass, $2,500. This is what we charge here at Emory. Balloon, $8,000 for six months only. By the way, the balloons, after you place them, six months later, you have to come and take it out, okay? So you have to really g uh, make, get all that, uh, get your benefit in that first six months. Metabolic follow-up is about $1,000 per year for, uh, in terms of the labs that you have to come. We follow them uh, um, first month, second month, uh, six months, and 12 months. Okay, so at the end of the day, if you compare them, two years of medical therapy really equals one surgery that you use for life. One year of medical therapy or plus a balloon is still less than one operation and less than two years of medical therapy. So I'm going to end there, and I'm going to give Peter a chance to give his rebuttal. And But it's you never do this by yourself, right? David Harrison, was when he was here, he helped us uh, take out the fat, and we actually uh, were able to um, isolate monocytes from it and inflammatory and immediate uh, fat. So I'm trying to, if there was a society for, for lipid society, I want to lobby for fat, for adipose tissue to be, uh, to get organ status. But thank you. Peter, you're up. that's going to be uh, that they're going to find in a couple of thousand years <laughs> documenting our society. So um, thank you, Ed, for your uh, inter introduction to my talk. Um, <laughs> so 
This is going to be, Ed is correct in the sense that this is mostly a critique of bariatric surgery rather than trying to argue for medical management. I'll do that a little bit. And this is, we're recycling this talk from a brawl we had in downtown Atlanta about a year ago. He did not send me his slides last night. I did send him my slides, as you can tell. So my issues are that, and there are only three main ones, that morbid obesity in at least some sense is not a surgical problem. And goals are achievable through some other means. And our approach, not just Ed's, but in medicine in general, doesn't address obesity at least sufficiently as a social issue, as Ed already mentioned. So I'm going to start with a quote by another bariatric surgeon, this one in the UK, back in 2014, who said, it's stupid, me operating on a perfectly normal digestive system just to stop people eating. It's nonsense. But unfortunately, it's the only thing that works for those people who already have passed the point of no return. So I fear, not Ed in particular, but we in medicine in general, may be judged harshly for using surgery to address non-surgical problems. And this problem has arisen in the past. One of them was something called surgical bacteriology. Henry Andrews Cotton was the medical director of the Trenton State Hospital, which was, as they changed the name, it used to be called the New Jersey Asylum. And he had this idea that madness was caused by occult bacterial infections. And so he went on this quest to excise teeth, tonsils, testicles, gallbladders, stomach spleens. Now, he's a psychiatrist, by the way. And he had about 30% mortality, and hundreds of people died. But don't think that everyone thought that he was a monster. You don't have to read all this. But he was honored at multiple medical institutions in Europe and on this continent. He was an invited speaker. And other people wanted to emulate him and wanted to know how he got these tremendous results. Parents of their families begged to be treated at Trenton, and those who could not demanded that their own doctors treat them with the new wonder cure. And most importantly, the state acknowledged the savings and expenses to taxpayer from these new treatments. Isn't that a wonderful thing? He even got a write-up in the New York Times, but it turned out to be fake news. A second example is the example of lobotomies. We don't talk about lobotomies a lot, but it was introduced by Dr. Moniz, a neurologist in 1936. It consists of scraping away connections to and from the prefrontal and anterior frontal lobes. He received the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1949 for discovery of the therapeutic value of lobotomy in certain psychoses. By 1949, 5,000 such operations had been done, and by 1951, over 18,000. So these were providers that we heralded as being, if you'll excuse the pun, on the cutting edge, but producing huge benefit for our society. History did not judge us kindly in those instances. Bariatric surgery isn't the only surgical approach. I've talked to a number of my colleagues about Jay Garrow, who introduced wiring people's jaws closed to keep them from eating. Introduced it in 1974, and you'll see that 30 to 40 kilogram weight loss. All you had to do was wire their jaws closed for eight to nine months. And I see people shaking their heads, and it seems so barbaric. And yet, we talk about removing pieces of people's stomach and rearranging their intestines, and we don't flinch. I think that's an odd contradistinction. The only reason we don't, one of the reasons we don't do this is it turned out not to be tremendously durable. As soon as they unwired the jaws, people ate a lot and gained the weight back. And reviewing, taking a further step back from what we do, it always brings to mind that maxim that we were taught, primum non nocere, above all, do no harm. And yet, while the mortality of surgeries, bariatric surgeries, is really very low, 
I think it's, we need to be clear that it's not that they don't have any complications. Um, overall complication rate in this JAMA surgery study from 2014 was about 17%. It's not nothing. And as these surgeries become more common, more people will be doing them. We have the incredible good fortune to have Dr. Lin and his staff doing surgeries here at Emory, but not everyone does. In this study in Michigan, they invited, it was purely in, uh, open to invitation, they invited surgeons to send in videos of their bariatric surgeries that were then in a blinded fashion evaluated by other bariatric surgeons and then graded on their surgical technique. And then they, after that, went um, retrospectively looked for surgical complications and correlated them and surprise, not surprisingly found that as surgical uh, skill declined, complication rates went up. So as we expand bariatric surgery on a broader societal level, we might be expected to have more and more complications as well. But maybe primum non nocere is a little too Pollyannish. Um, on the surgical building in my medical school, uh, they had the other piece of Latin, vulnerando sanimus, which means we wound in order to heal. I always love that. So maybe we, instead of saying we never do any harm, we should actually take responsibility for the wounding that we do and simply be very calculating and cold about those assessments. Um, I was interested to find out in this meta-analysis that while the quality of life improves after bariatric surgery, universally in all the studies, it's not equally distributed. So for example, it's interesting that the mental quality of life domains don't increase as much as the physical. So diabetes goes away, joints get better, lipids drop, and while the people are happier, they're not as happier as they are healthier. And in a Dutch study, it, it turned out that about 63% of all the patients that they had bariatric surgery on overestimated the results of the surgery that they were gonna get. Now you might say, this is just misplaced expectation. But that might explain that this degree of dissatisfaction in their quality of life, that they're not patients that do this, at least some of them, aren't getting what they thought they were gonna get. Would that, could that have uh, a consequence? Perhaps. In a really large study um, in Denmark, a registry study, with over 22,000 patients receiving bariatric surgery in over a million patient years, um, these are patients compared to pre-bariatric surgery, psychiatric admissions increased in three, five, and seven years after bariatric surgery. As did psychiatric emergency room visits and self-harm episodes. A similar finding in a 2016 study. Self-harm episodes increased in total patients, and these were um, Canadians, not uh, Danish people, of uh, self-harm increased, predominantly female, uh, predominantly in the older age group, not in the younger ones, but of lower socioeconomic group, and mostly rural. Interestingly, in that latter study, the self-harm events didn't happen in the first six months to a year after surgery, but they were late events two and three years after the surgery. Uh, at a time that we typically, or may not, be following them cl as closely. Now those are self-harm events, and not all studies have shown, in that very first, in the, in the Dutch study, for example, excuse me, in the Danish study that I so showed you, they found no increase in suicide. But other studies have showed an increase in suicide. So Tyndall, which was a study done in Pennsylvania in up 1995 to 2004, 16,000 ORs, they found almost a six-fold increase in suicides after bariatric surgery 
And then more recently, in um, an international review, it was thought to be approximately fourfold increase in suicide after bariatric surgery. Um, the second reason that I have questions about proceeding with bariatric surgery on a large scale is that it may not be necessary. So it may be what people want, but from a medical standpoint, uh, Tina already told us that even more moderate weight loss can address some of the, um, the medical issues that we face. And so this is from the uh, American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, and there are many different organizations that put out guidelines. This is the only one that I'm most familiar with. The primary therapeutic endpoint is improvement in adiposity-related complications, not a preset decline in body weight. But that's not necessarily what many of the patients want. So now, don't laugh. I'm going to say diet and exercise. And as a matter of fact, it still heads up all the recommendations for every professional organization, diet and exercise. And then pharmaceutical assisted weight loss, I'm not going to talk a lot about it. But I want to make this point. This is a study called the Look Ahead Study. It was a 10-year study with um, over 5,000 patients with diabetes divided into two groups, a randomized trial. In one group, they just said, you need to lose, eat less, and do some exercise. And the other group got in, intense coaching and counseling about exercise. They were given gym memberships, track shoes, tennis rackets. They met three or four times a month with a coach to guide them, and they got some results. Up in the upper left, we see a profound weight loss that isn't, it isn't totally durable, but they end up losing about 6% of their weight over 10 years. Um, and in the lower right, glycated hemoglobin, these were not profoundly diabetic uh, patients to begin with, but they did get some benefit and better than control. So what this shows us, and this is without weight loss medicine, and to me what this says, it was the study thought was believed to be a failure because the end point, the primary end point was coronary vascular disease events, and it didn't show any difference there. But it did show, it did support the underlying science that exercise and decreased consumption does what we expect it to. So maybe even these small measures are actually meeting some of our medical goals. It may not be exactly what the patients want, but they are reducing or improving health. Um, this is just a short list of the types of medicines that we have available that Tina, I think, is probably using more in her clinic for obesity. And uh, I we have also have a number of new medicines on the horizon that I think are going to be much more um, efficacious. So that finally, I think we can all agree that there has to be some approach and, and recognition that obesity is at least in part a social disease, which is why you all laughed at that, the picture of the fat David. We have our personal spheres, our familial spheres, and our social sphere that surround us. And as clinicians, we deal with that inside one. We talk to the patient or does do something to the patient. But the idea that we're going to be successful in treating something like obesity by focusing on that little guy in that inner circle, I think is naive. I've already presented this data in a different context, but Christakis and Fowler took um, the Framingham, Massachusetts data and plotted these, um, these bubble graphs. It was a population study and they took everyone's BMI and they also had uh, significant data about the interconnectedness of the people in the small town in Massachusetts. The green dots are uh, non-obese people and the yellow dots are obese people. And the red lines are uh, red or blue, I can't remember, uh, are relatives, and then the other, one, the other color are friends. So they plot the relationship between people in this way. And we see over time that not only the number of people increase, but the number of yellow dots increase. These people are getting progressively obese. 
But then they looked at the connectedness and correlated whether these people became obese with who they knew. And it, they found a couple of things. One, obese people tend to cluster. They all know each other, or they're in their familial spheres. And non-obese people tend to cluster. And it turns out that if you have an ego-perceived friend, that's someone that you recognize as your friend, and that friend gets obese, you have a 71% chance, increased chance, of becoming obese yourself. And yet, if it's someone who says an alter-perceived friend, someone who says they're your friend, but you don't think so, it doesn't matter what they do. They get fat, you don't get fat. Now, if it's a mutual friend, you, you say they're your friend, and they say they're your friend, 180% chance. If one of you gets obese, the other one's going to get obese. Now, there's some other interesting things. Like, we don't care too much what our boyfriend and girlfriend say. It doesn't affect anything. And we only care a little bit what our spouse says. But I think more importantly is down here. We as physicians are essentially our neighbors. And we don't care what our neighbor says. So we walk into the office, and Ed says, you're overweight. You need to eat less. And I say, mm-hmm, and I leave. So bariatric surgery I don't think is the only or even the best tool, although it is a tool in our armamentarium. High efficacy is associated with real risk and perturbation of normal GI function. Bariatric surgery may be best utilized as a research tool to understand energy balance physiology and lead us to the next medical breakthrough. Non-surgical weight loss interventions may meet therapeutic goals for many patients, and there's obviously more work required. Thank you very much. Now, Ed, let us be speaking to some of you here, Peter. And what, be sure and speak into the mic. This is being broadcast and streamed behind the podium, and Spencer out here will have a mic that he can hand out to the audience. And, uh, Ed, do you have a meter rebuttal, or, or do you want to go a little bit more than you did? I, I think in many ways we are talking about the same things, right? And... Um, I like the data that you're talking about. I think it's much more than just the actual surgery itself. I think your last comment about what we're telling our patients because they think of, they perceive us as their friend or their neighbor is, is probably useless. Right? We've got to do a lot more uh, and give people more options. Uh, rather than just saying, hey, do more of this or do more of that, we need to replace something and put something else in that place. Does Ms. Starr has a question? Yeah, thanks. That was a wonderful talk, and uh, I've certainly had plenty of years of experience of telling patients to eat better, uh, exercise more, and get some skinny friends, and it only goes <laughs> so far. Uh, so I, I'm curious to know, because for any individual patient in front of us, this is a journey, I'm curious to know what sorts of uh, shared decision-making approaches that you've learned are effective to help a patient decide ultimately, is surgery the right way for me, or is it um, more the medical route? I, I don't know how what kind of coaching you're giving patients in, uh, in terms of considering for weight loss surgery. I really think we're um, most physicians who are not most medical physicians are not counseling their patients about uh, weight loss surgery options. If you think about it, of all those people who are eligible for weight loss surgery, it's probably one to two percent who actually get surgery. So the numbers uh, uh, there's plenty to go around for a lot of people, but I don't think we're counseling our patients well enough for that, about it. Part of the reason is because um, when you do your internal medicine residencies, when do you ever go see a bariatric operation? When do you ever do a rotation with other surgeons in this area? Right? There's only so many times, so many hours in a day, right? Yeah, and you have to fit all these other rotations in there. So we're not doing a good job bridging that, uh, that knowledge gap or information trans transfer gap. Uh, and I still think we have a long ways to go on uh, addressing things early before people have a BMI of 50. And, uh, that has to do with the way our healthcare system, and I say that tongue in cheek, is uh, organized in this country. But it, it, the message has to get out and, and the emphasis has to be delivered before people are hopeless and desperate. I, I just add to that, you can see a lot of the illnesses where we, we're very much siloed 
And I think that we'll be better positioned if we can kind of build those bridges between it and not say that you're a cardiology patient or a cardiac surgery patient, not saying that you need ob you're obese and you need surgery versus that. We need to have more opportunities where we work together. Mitchell. Hi, this is Jonathan Crane. I teach at the Center for Ethics here at Emory. Um, and thank you very much for the presentations here. Uh, both of you were reflecting on, uh, basically, you were lamenting that uh, what we have in our medical and surgical toolboxes are reactive interventions. They're not proactive. They're not preventing these food-related and consumptive-related maladies from occurring in the first place. And you both lamented the, the siloization of our medical systems. Um, and I'm wondering to what degree you would uh, encourage a cross-unit, multifaceted approach to think proactively about food and uh, consumptive-related maladies uh, so th as to prevent people from actually needing to go under the knife in the first place. That's question one. And question two is, to what degree are you also hearkening to uh, the China studies, for example, that talk about, um, that, that looked at the various things that people are eating and the, the ultimate demises that they, they suffered? Uh, well, I'll answer backwards. You know, a lot of times, you, you, the countries that you think, these people will never get big, right? And you, with affluence, uh, that's changing. You know, diabetes is, is actually a, a, a big scare in places like ch formerly China, right? That, that, that we think they, they didn't have the resources, but that is actually one of the biggest health problems that they're facing right now. Um, the silo business is a critical problem, and you know, we can say uh, the medical homes concept. We actually like to take advantage of that. You know, at least in our group, we can say, all right, we operate on our patients, but we have resources in there to help manage the diabetes that come along with it. You know, that we're just using that as an example. Um, and we have, we bring on medical, so we have a um, couple of medical people, med med medical physicians, internal internists. Uh, we, we used to have family medicine doctor who actually worked in surgery, hired and salaried by surgery because we wanted them to be part of this, this concept of, hey, we're managing these patients a as a whole. So this cut takes a silo out of it. Those of you who work with re uh, nephrology, transplant nephrology, that's sort of, uh, or hepatology, that's sort of the whole concept that we're trying to, we're trying to do. At the end of the day, it's really the cost, right? And who's going to bill for these things? And when we, and when the, all that goes away, it doesn't really matter. At, at the end of the day, I, for that one reason, I like the concept of being able to push one pa the pa patient into one place, and everybody comes together and offers the care, and sort of this um, pit stop mentality. What What are your thoughts? Uh, I think it's it's a very difficult problem. If it were easy, it already would have been solved. But the, the siloization of what we do, part of it uh, is a result of our uh, increasing specialized areas of knowledge. We arrange our workspaces to suit what we do. And the workspace uh, for a surgeon may not be the same workspace uh, for an internist. Um, so I don't, I don't know how to answer that question. I think a lot of it has to do with reimbursements and time and, and structure, uh, yeah, infrastructure as well. Uh, I don't, I don't have a good so solution for that. As far as what they eat, um, uh, I think I may have very uh, different views on uh, the, the disadvantages or the, the, the relative advantages on different food stuff. I think the majority uh, problem, the largest problem is simply overabundance rather than a, a particular kind of food. I think that's uh, it's less clear that, that that's the major problem. I'll, 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 we'll get to you. I'll add that I think it starts off with a little language lesson. You know, when you actually hang out with each other, what you say means. I, even from these slides, I noticed a difference. When you were talking about obesity, in my mind, I'm thinking about the super obese patients. So we're talking about two very different. Uh, 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 yeah. So for those people in the middle, the, those people who are not sup super obese, and those people who are overweight, there is something we can offer. Because this is where the, I think the balloons will help. We don't have to alter people's anatomy. And these, the, the sleeves or things that will decrease a little absorption to give people that jump start. And then at the same time, the, the medical management for their diabetes. This is where we can actually bridge things. You know, the simple ones, I don't need to get involved with as a surgeon. The super yeah. obese ones, we really need to give them that 30, 40% uh, 
a head start, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the people in the middle, I call them the orphans. They've often been orphaned. Mm -hmm. Because it's not your area, it's not my area, but I think that between the two groups, we can offer these middle therapies, the alternative therapies that we talked about, without big anatomical alterations and benefit them. Without getting into the uh, political arena, it's interesting you're talking about social problems, that the, uh, there's a suggestion that the food stamp program be replaced by, uh, or partially by a cash uh, output, and uh, to replace it with food packages, a la Blue Apron or whatever. And so there's something that may, may go nowhere, but it's an obvious uh, uh, intrusion can the government uh, solve or partially solve uh, the problem of what people are eating and uh, what they choose to buy at, at the supermarket? Interesting. We'll, we'll take that as a comment, right? <laughs> 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 you want to you yeah. get into that? <laughs> one, is any, one, other, one final question I'll ask, and then we can end, is these people that have the surgery come in and they're no longer, or they're no, or not, unhappy, but they don't reach the happy level that they wanted to. Do you think that this was related to the complications that come from the surgery? Is related to the mindset of the patient that, that embarked on this course anyway? What, what's the reason for that? Uh, I, I don't know for sure what the reason is. Um, the, the literature, uh, my reading in the literature would suggest that there is a, a small preponderance of, uh, there was an increased preponderance of mental health in people who go choose bariatric surgery, um, whether those, whether that's the reason that they have uh, more uh, psychiatric illness after, I don't know. Um, and I don't think, I didn't see an a, a solid expl explanation for why that occurs. Why I mean, it could be the obesity itself, that is the psychiatric condition. Or people with psychiatric issues more often become obese. Um, uh, whether it is truly dissatisfaction or misplaced expectation, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. All right, sir, you've been very informative. Thank you for that. Oh, you're very welcome. Good job, man. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're always there.